It's my pleasure to welcome you today to Project Launchpad. This is a truly unique moment in higher education. The challenges for the groups of students that we serve, particularly the 18 to 26 age group, really are significant and really are different than those that other folks face. This is a time for universities to collaborate, not compete. When Houston launched Apollo 13 and there were problems in flight, ground control worked together to ensure that those astronauts returned safely. We have the same mission today. The future of our students and the future of our nation depends upon us developing responsible and reasonable and quick responses to the challenges that we face right now. So thank you for being here today. I'm delighted to welcome you to the first panel. These are a group of incredible people. This is a group of incredible people from whom I'm, I've heard great ideas and insights, and I look forward to hearing them share those with you today. Um, I'd like to open by introducing George Blumenthal, who is the director for Berkeley's Center for Studies in Higher Education and the um, Chancellor Emeriti from University of California, Santa Cruz. George. Thank you so much, Marlene. And to all of you out there, welcome for joining us today for Project Launchpad, a national digital summit. We're going to invite, I'm going to invite all of you to ask questions if you would like throughout this webinar by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So if you have questions, enter them in the Q&A, and if there's time, we will get to them uh, before we finish. This is, a, as Marlene indicated, this is a great opportunity. Universities are known for doing, for, for great teaching, research, and public service. And Project Launchpad is an opportunity to combine all of those by sharing our research, the work that we've done to better understand how to ensure student success. And that really is a public service. As, as Marlene indicated, we have today with us a great panel of guests. And let me introduce them all briefly right now. First, Wayne Frederick, who's the president of Howard University. We also have Joan Gable, who's the president of the University of Minnesota. Also joining us is Russell Lowry Hart, who's the president of Amarillo College, and Maury McInnes, the president of Stony Brook University. We also have Donde Plowman, Chancellor of the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. And of course, another panelist is Marlene Trump, who is of course the president of Boise State University. So without further ado, let me get to some questions and I will invite responses from several of our, uh, our panelists to each of these questions. And let's, let's just start with the first one. One of the things that we've seen in, in recent surveys of students, uh, in particular, uh, the consortium of, the, of CIRU uh, has found in some of their studies that mental health issues have been exas exacerbated significantly during the COVID epidemic. So the question is, what are the material strategies that you've done that are directed at mental health uh, in this time of challenge in order to help your students dealing with mental health issues? And let me start by uh, calling on Wayne Frederick. Yeah, first, uh, let me thank you for uh, moderating and certainly thank President Trump for the invitation. You know, it's, it's obviously been a difficult time. We, uh, uh, all our classes are virtual. So we have been expanding our counseling services. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, there, were, there were significant, uh, I would say, accommodations made in terms of being able to practice. As you know, um, outside of certain jurisdictions, you, you could not uh, see patients or engage with patients as it were, i.e. our students, and provide um, interventions. And so some of that was, was fortunately relaxed. Uh, some of that has since expired. So what we've also done is expanded our regional and local networks for where our students reside so that they can their um, care can also be transferred there as well. And we've also held some virtual events as well for both the staff, because I think uh, sometimes the staff in this circumstance can be overlooked. And so we've been having some virtual happy hours um, that gets people there uh, without the requisite liquor. But once they get there, we've had everything from music as well as um, uh, uh, some issues on wellness and mindfulness uh, presentations to, to keep them healthy as well. And we've also expanded our employee assistant program for our faculty. So I know your question was about the students, but I think it's, it's critical as well 
that I do mention that we put some effort into the faculty and students as well so that they could also better serve the students' mental health as well. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, Marlene, would you like to comment? Yes, thank you so much, George. Um, there are a few things we've done that I think have been quite significant. One of them I put in the Project Launchpad resources that you can find online. And that's the development of our Reaching Out Handbook, which was designed by our Counseling Center to help our faculty and staff really be prepared um, to respond to student mental health issues. And we've actually created a wellness working group that has allowed for an integrated approach across the university. So um, uh, folks from mental health and well-being, but also from academic affairs, also from student life. So folks from across the spectrum. We've created special group counseling sessions and we've seen a real uptick in the use of those. And they've allowed people to gather together, whether virtually or in um, masked physical distancing. But that's given, um, those have been uh, free and available to faculty, staff and students. And they've been uh, really significant. And if you come to the grad session today, you'll hear more about a program that we've pioneered, our graduate dean has pioneered called Gradwell. And there are some small things we've done that I think have been quite significant. We've invited our faculty to all um, put a statement in their syllabi that helps the students know from each of their faculty that where the resources are for mental health support, um, but also that the that faculty understand that that's a, a particular challenge at this time. And we've really prioritized faculty's role in empowering them by training faculty in simple interventions including our reaching out handbook. Great, thank you, Marlene. Would any of, any of the other panelists like to comment as well? Well, George, hearing, one uh, of the things, one of sure, the things please, we please. did also was target some unique services to students in quarantine and in isolation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, we were just starting to get good at that when the semester was over. And so we'll be using that again in the spring. Things like our Dean of Students office sponsoring quarantine with the Dean Knights and just opportunities to connect people to each other. That's been the hardest part, I'm sure for all of us, is the lack of connection for young people. And so there's kind of the unique need. When you're 20 years old uh, and you're told you got to stay away from your friends for 14 days, that's tough. So trying to target a unique services to them has been a priority also. Great, thank you, Dante. Uh, would anyone else like to comment? Okay, seeing none, let's move on to the next question. And that, that concerns the issue of um, supporting academic success for students. So what material strategies have you used in this difficult uh, time to support student academic success? And um, let, let me start with uh, Russell, please. Um, well, thank you so much, George. And thanks for uh, the panelists for sharing uh, your best practices. They're impressive and important. Uh, for Amarillo College, um, what we were doing before the pandemic became even more important after the pandemic. Uh, what we've learned in, from our students is the biggest barriers to our student success in the classroom had nothing to do with the classroom. The pandemic has only exposed that even more. Childcare, healthcare, housing, food, um, utility payments, legal services, because it costs a lot to be poor in this country. And COVID has only uh, expanded the number of people that are falling into uh, the, the need categories that we typically don't see in students. Uh, so one of the first things we did is we hired social workers and put in a case management system to connect our students to the resources that our community has available. Uh, we learned that uh, social services um, in Texas, $8 billion of social service aid went unclaimed uh, two years ago. We have the resources to solve these problems. We have stereotype that if you're living in the war zone of poverty or in a pandemic, that you know where those resources are. And our social workers and case management system uh, served over half of our student body. We served over 5,000 students in the pandemic in a case management system, emergency aid, food, housing assistance, childcare assistance, 
mental health assistance. Um, we fixed cars. We um, helped buy computers. Um, things that we knew we needed to do beforehand, but the pandemic only required more of it in that scale. Well, thank you. Um, uh, Joan, do you, would you like to comment as well? Yes, thank you, George. And, and just following up on that um, incredible work that is happening at Amarillo, I think that um, there's a, a real realization in many ways that was exposed by the pandemic about the difference between the classroom experience and the beyond the classroom and community experience. And a, a proxy for that is the pandemic where nationally we saw so little transmission of the virus in the classroom. And yet the virus had this tremendous impact on our work as academic institutions, largely for the reasons that were just described that I won't repeat. But at the same time, if you think about our core mission is to have these students successfully progress and, and have their opportunities elevated and, and have them have every opportunity to, in um, a welcoming way, become their best self as they define it. And so in addition to the kinds of outreach work that was just described in order to make sure that our students' basic needs are being met, and I know we will talk about that more um, in subsequent in subsequent questions, we did try to make sure that the classroom experience was maximized given that it was so changed. So we did a lot of faculty training and we did a lot of work on not just their ability to teach online, but their ability to understand what it would mean to accommodate students in this environment. Um, we did a lot of communication and town halls, gave students a lot of voice to express what they wanted instead of assuming that we knew better than they do, which is always humbling when they remind us that we don't necessarily. Um, and then we changed the grading scale like a lot of universities did around the country in the spring to SN. And there's discussion about that and what that will mean for this semester too and ongoing. And in ways that we all thought were impossible before you cannot possibly change the entire campus to an SN grading scale, that's, you know, that's literally, and yet, what do you know, it's not impossible. And so all of this gives us the opportunity to really think about what it means to um, us to impart information to our students, whether that's skills or competencies, how we assess that information, whether our assessments are unnecessarily triggering or aggravating, or whether they actually get at mastery of the material, which should be the only thing that ultimately matters, and how we evolve to meet them where they are, because they're changing, we're changing, we're all changing, and, and it's time. Thank you, well said. Um, uh, would any other panelists like to comment on this? I mean, academic success is so important. Okay, well, abruptly. Oh, please go ahead, Dondi. When, when we suddenly and abruptly sent everyone home in the spring, uh, and for us, we had about a 10 day period to plan and put it together. One of the things we um, started doing and have continued this fall is this little pulse surveys of the students. So one question last spring, how are you doing? Uh, I'm, I'm making it. Uh, I've got this. Number two, uh, I'm struggling, but I think I'm going to get there. The third one, I need a lot of help. And then the, everyone who answered the third one got a direct phone call from our academic support services. And I think that that has helped us see that direct intervention before there are maybe some problems and using virtual little uh, pulse surveys. Uh, we're, we've continued it again this fall a little bit, maybe have two or three questions this fall, but helping target support services, um, I think has been uh, really beneficial. And I want it to stick with us probably more systematically mm -hmm. after COVID than just uh, you know kind of a gunshot uh, effort, but that's been useful. George, would you mind if I respond? I think that's so important. and. One of the things that we learned from our surveys that were similar, it's such a great idea, is that the outside of, of classroom living was having the biggest impact on their learning inside the classroom. So we had to we had to look at what was happening outside the classroom. And one of the things that we learned is that we had students that had technology, but it wasn't effective. It wasn't um, it, it it wasn't working. And we ended up offering a, 
like a fix it shop just so people could bring in their computers there so students could bring in their computers so they could learn from home not something that we thought we would end up doing uh, in the pandemic we learned that from the surveys and it's something that we will keep um, after the pandemic is over yeah thank you i think that's really important uh, marlene did you want to add something yeah, I just um, uh, what Don and Russell has said have made me uh, think about something that I hadn't thought previously to mention, which is that we actually worked with local libraries around the state because Idaho, like every state in the country, has rural areas. And we had um, taken all of our Wi Fi hotspots and moved them to locations like over parking lots so that students could access that Wi Fi, drive onto campus, safely access that Wi Fi, and drive away to upload and download. And we worked with um, libraries around the state so that they would do the same, so they could um, move their, their hotspots outside so that people could access them at public libraries. And we saw that gave our students a lot more access, um, especially in rural areas. Great, thank you. Yeah, no, that's very important and very interesting. Any other comments? Okay, um, let's move on to the next question, which, I, which some of you have touched on already, but I think it's an important one, and, and that is, how has this period philosophically shifted your understanding of our work in higher education? And let me start with uh, Maury. Well, thank you, and thank you uh, for pulling this panel together and for all of you being here today. And yes, what I'm going to say does in many ways echo some of the points that have already been raised. I would say one of the most important learnings to come out of this moment is how absolutely central our students' well-being is to their academic success. And the challenges of the pandemic have really highlighted that for us. For them to be able to learn, um, we need to be paying attention to their mental health. The reality is, though, that um, traditional counseling services are, can never be the be-all and end-all of treating their mental health issues. Instead, we in higher education are going to need to adopt a public health approach to how we approach mental health issues. Um, and that means really paying attention to prevention, detection, early intervention, and then all the way through to treatment. And obviously, in the pandemic, many of us have made many important changes to how we deliver the treatment, right? We're all using telehealth. That means many of us, if we weren't already, have gone to a 24 seven model, which means we're actually meeting them at the moments when they're most in crisis, which is usually not nine to five. Um, but I think even more important for us anyway, has been the ways in which we have been able to extend and expand a lot of our work in the prevention and detection space. So in the prevention space, we have a great center um, for prevention and public outreach, and they have a ton of programs that our students have very much been accessing more um, than in the past. And so I think that's very much evidence of uh, the challenges that many of our students are feeling in the middle of this pandemic. Uh, we involve peer educators. They lead a lot of workshops. Some of it is about getting the tools, not just to the people who might be in need, but to the larger student body and to our faculty and staff so that they can both identify, but also be there to support our students. Um, so these larger um, peer workshops. Uh, we have videos uh, called Minute on the Mind that a lot of people access on a variety of different topics. Uh, we have a great program of healing arts where we lead workshops for students using creative work as um, part of a, a, a sort of well-being uh, exercise. We have a self-care anywhere website as part of the center that gives access to lots of tools for our students. Um, and we lead workshops on a, a variety of different topics. Those are just some of the many activities uh, that we are doing in the prevention space. And we are seeing an increased take up uh, in this moment of need. Great, yes, thank you, Maury. Uh, Wayne, would you like to comment? Yeah, yeah. you know, one of the things I think that this has really um, illuminated is the, actually, I would say the importance of our higher education institutions uh, for 
the past couple of decades, I think our higher education institutions have not been getting a fair shake as it were in terms of the role we play in society. And if you look at just the response from the pandemic and you look at how many academic medical centers have been involved in researching a vaccine and researching uh, the epidemiology behind uh, the pandemic and, and what we should be doing, adding to the public health data, um, I think it goes to emphasize uh, the, not just the quality, but the utility of our higher education um, institutions. I think that the second thing that it has done, um, to some extent, I, I hope, it has also debunked the fact that all of this can be done just simply virtually and that uh, residential campuses were in peril. I think that was the doomsday um, that was out there pre-pandemic. And I think what we recognize is that the socialization that we sometimes speak to, but probably do not advertise enough, um, is a major part of what makes our higher education institutions so important in, in terms of what we do. So students get the technical knowledge but the socialization of the ability to critical think, to engage and discuss and, and discuss and, and have discourse, especially around um, critical arguments is the other thing that students clearly miss. It doesn't always happen in a classroom in a formal environment, uh, but it clearly happens in a way that they learn the humanity of what, what we um, think is important. And last thing I would say is it also has underscored um, the importance of social sciences and humanity and humanities. Um, I think at the end of the day, all that we do and try to do in our academic environment really is about our larger humanity. And we, I think hopefully have recognized that we can't separate it. So if anything, I think um, we've arrived at a moment where we have to double down on how well we do it going forward, regardless of what field of study uh, students enter our institutions pursuing. Yes, thank you, Wayne. Um, Marlene, you're next on the list. Would you like to comment? Yes, and I just want to say I really appreciate everything um, that folks have said uh, already in this session because it's it's such a crystallization of so many things I've been thinking about. And I, I really thought a lot about this question. I, I think that um, uh, I would say two things that are that have really been paradigm shifts for me. One is that I think we can no longer think of education. I think most people who are working in higher education didn't think of it this way, but I think we haven't done enough yet to articulate the ways in which that our thinking has changed. It's, it's not a passive service that people sample like a buffet. People aren't coming in and picking classes and taking their plate and going to their table and eating. It's a much more active and flexible connection to students and to the collective of the student body. It's a dance. And that really is a paradigm shift that we are, we are as institutions of higher education, um, data informed tailored services that need to meet individual human needs. And this often at a massive scale. And I think this, I think sometimes what people imagine is this means we are less rigorous. And I don't think it means we're less rigorous. I think it means we're becoming more flexible. And the second thing that I think I would say, and then I want to um, I mention some particular um, strategies that, that we're using, is that I think in, in this moment where our nation is so um, divided, politically, socially, um, the, the, in terms of um, ideologically how we understand what higher education does, I actually think higher education can play a key role in bringing people into dialogue with one another so that we can actually solve our shared and common problems um, in the same way that this panel and this day has been designed for people to share strategies with each other. I think there's something very powerful and profound about higher education not being willing to fall into that polarized conflict and being a part of the solutions. And in terms of that flexibility, I wanted to just mention a couple of issues. Um, we created, like many universities did, much more remote access to the classroom, which means that our students, whatever the reason, may need to be remote for a week or two during a semester, and that no longer has to disrupt their education. If you have to go home and care for a family member or you personally fall ill, or you need extra time in a workplace, and you can access that classroom that you were in a face-to-face -face environment in for six weeks, for two weeks remotely, it changes what's possible for education. That really is a game changer for our students. 
we also created a program at Boise State called um, Bronco Gap Year. And what this, we thought this program was gonna be an assistance for new students who were coming out of high school and who sort of lost the support to transition over to college. And we certainly had some students who took us up on that and it assigned each student a dedicated faculty mentor. So you got a faculty person who would work with you doing um, reflective work on where, whatever you were doing at that time, but also had the option to take up to 12 hours over the course of a year in online credits for one very low price. <clears throat> but, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> we had more of our current students utilize that gap year program than those students transitioning from high school. So we saw that our students needed increased flexibility. And I'll stop there so I can call. <laughs> Thank you, Marlene. George, can I add, well, I want to add one other thing and build on what Marlene was just speaking about. I think that in all of my years in higher education, I've never seen a campus come together focused on a single goal. We typically think, well, we have our research mission, we have our teaching mission, we have our, you know, uh, student life mission, we have, but this brought us unexpectedly all together around the same problem. And so when, when we see faculty researchers pivot and, and turn their labs into labs that help us with the testing and, and, and keeping students safe, when you see the faculty senate listening to the student senate about the grade options they need, you know, when you invite faculty into the conversation about mental health, I just, I hope that this sticks with us, this sense of co a little bit of coherence for the moment. And, and um, it's just an understatement to use the word collaboration, but just really forced working together, steering the ship in a way that I, I don't, I've never experienced before. And I remember taking the tour of the classrooms this summer after the, the uh, people in maintenance and facilities had redone everything. They were so excited to point out the six feet distance and how you could still see the board and 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 so that we need to keep that keep that up uh, post COVID and so that's going to be one of my goals. I think it was we it was an accident, but it was a great accident and a great outcome from it. And what I would add to that, Dondi, is that um, what I was going to say before I choked myself was that um, we. We actually incorporated mental health into our strategic planning process in a way that we might not have otherwise. We've used students to be a part of the design thinking to really strategize how we respond in this moment. And I agree with you, we just need those processes to continue because as, as Joan said earlier, we learned so much from the constituent groups that we serve um, that make us better at doing our jobs. Yeah, I wanted to say amen to that. I think you're absolute, both of you are absolutely right about that. Uh, would anyone else like to comment before we move on to the next question? Okay, hearing no one, um, let's move on. We've touched on this a little bit already, but um, I'd like to start, ask Maury, um, are there ways in which you can come to see or read your student problems differently as a consequence of this period that we're going through? Yeah, I mean, it in some ways relates to just what uh, many of you were addressing um, in this moment. Again, things that we knew were true before have been significantly heightened. So, you know, one thing that's long been pointed out as an important factor in student success is their sense of connectedness with their campus community. And that has been so challenged at this moment. Um, whether campuses are all virtual for their learning or more like ours, ours was about 25% in person and the rest was virtual. Um, we had about half of our normal residents choosing to reside with us on campus. So, you know, we had a diminished sense of campus presence boy, were they all committed to wanting to remain on campus. It was 
so important to them that campus be open, that what in-person learning could continue, could do so. Here's how well our students did um, in enforcing with one another the relationship between personal responsibility and reducing the spread of COVID. We are a campus community when full of about 26,000 students. We had only 90 cases in the entire semester and we tested our students weekly. Um, so their commitment to remaining open, it was so important to them, they really came together. But despite that, in being so stringent in following all the guidelines, it meant that in many ways they felt personally disconnected. Um, physical distancing, wearing a mask, not being able to gather in groups meant that they ended up feeling quite isolated. And so we've been doing a lot of work to try to combat that, very creative ideas about ways to bring people together, either, either physically outdoors, which was great in the fall, it got more challenging as the semester went along and it got colder, um, but really great, you know, outdoor movie nights and outdoor yoga events and outdoor workout classes and outdoor arts classes and all those kinds of things as a way of connection, as well as lots of Zoom get togethers. But we also found that from them, a lot of their sense of disconnectedness is what is happening in the remote learning. That, that space that we don't always think about, which is the gathering for class beforehand and the conversations that would happen in a classroom and the ways in which people would talk with each other as they leave a classroom, that doesn't really happen in the same way in a remote setting. And so one of our students just gave us this easy, simple feedback, which was, could the faculty please open Zoom 30 minutes before class and leave it open 30 minutes afterwards. And we'll still have that space to talk with each other, to get to know each other and so forth. So that's just one simple little fix of the many that we are trying to help our faculty you know, learn about so that they can continue to help students with that sense of connectedness that's so important to their academic success. George, if I could jump in on that. Um so inspired by what uh, Maury just said, because I think um, a, a theme already emerging from our remarks so far is this really interesting balance between this expanded appetite for doing things in distributed ways and the way in which we distribute, in fact, can be mission fulfilling because it allows students flexibility or we can meet them where they are or they can pursue other opportunities. And yet this palpable truly urgent need to feel tethered and what that means for the campus community. And one of the things we've seen here in Minnesota, and I know there are versions of this elsewhere, but that has been very profound on this campus because the largest part of the Twin Cities campus sits in Minneapolis and literally right outside our gates was where George Floyd was tragically killed, is that some of this sense of urgency to feel tethered and anchored is to the campus community and the feeling of belonging on a campus and being a part of the campus, but also to be part of the community writ large and what that means in terms of their voice and their leadership. And we've seen, um, I, I mean, student advocacy or student activism is certainly not new, but we've seen a, a, a sort of recalibration, if you will, of how students are engaging in the broader expression of activism and voice and a very different way of supporting them, of, of hearing them, of um, working with them so that they can express that voice, which we absolutely want them to. It makes their um, the overall learning experience better, deeper, and more profound in all the ways that we've been discussing. But it also feels different to us than it would have if they were physically sitting in my office, for example, which has happened on this campus before, or otherwise doing the um, the things that we've seen historically. And this is new, and it's something that I think we need to think about because in their um, 
identity and, and ability to self-actualize around that expression of voice is their evolution as a leader. And it's part of their learning experience and we need to meet them where they are on that too. So in creating this virtual connectivity to campus community also means creating this connectivity to the community as a whole and what that can, how we can support that and consider that part of our mission in their educational fulfillment. Thank you, Joan. Um, Marlene, would you like to comment as well? Thank you very much. Um, you know, I, my son who's 18 approached me and in many ways that was the genesis for thinking through these issues. And I wrote a piece for Education Dive about the mental health impacts of this moment. I think when a lot of people were initially just thinking about the physical health impacts of COVID, um, I was really concerned about mental health because my son came to me and he said, this is much harder for me than it is for say a 35 year old. And I honestly thought that can be true because a 35 year old may have children and, and a job and maybe they can't, that person can't work right now. And, <clears throat> but the more um, I looked into the research, the, the age band 18 to 26 is experiencing two and a half times greater mental health impacts than other people. And that's because this moment is their launch pad. So that's really where the concept for this came from. And I think um, different ways we see our students, I think to see them, we've always been concerned about outcomes. And I think more and more universities and colleges are shifting to ask, how do we continue to support students as they seek their career in the language of our honors dean, as they make a living and make a life? How do we continue to, to, in, to increase our connection and our touch with them during this critical time? And I've been teaching a class this year that I intentionally chose to teach in order to engage with our students and ask them to tell me firsthand directly, what are you learning? What are you experiencing? What do you need differently? And the kinds of things that Dondi was talking about, about what we're doing for students in quarantine, um, our strategies of, they asked us to deliver granny crafts to students who were in isolation or quarantine watercolors, um, knitting with instructions, um, uh, things that would allow them to do some coloring books, things that would allow them to do something creative so that they didn't feel like it was just work. And, and so uh, the learning that we've taken from our students in that class, it was also my students that told me, I had a student and, and most of the students in my class this semester are student leaders. So they're leaders in student government, they're leaders in our residence halls association. Um, our students said to me, we would take every single class remotely if we could have one football game. And, and that was a really profound moment for me because I thought, seriously, you'd rather be in remote biology than and, and get access to a football game. But for them, it was about this community experience that Maury was talking about. So how do we actually begin to create something different? And I wanna add one more piece to this, which is we already knew as universities and colleges <clears throat> that our students were neurologically wired differently when they came to us than we were as students. Um, they've had access to technology and in a completely different way. My son grew up with a computer in his hand that's a different way of wiring someone neurologically. And I think now asking the question, how do we serve that student differently? is not just about how do we serve student needs, but how are we thinking about how they are intellectually processing information differently because of the different way they've accessed information and engaged information their entire lives. And I, I, I actually was explaining to some students how different it was for me to think about where to go to college when everything was a brochure sitting in my bedroom, as opposed to being able to surf online and learn more about the institutions online. And so I think there's these, these different ways that we're thinking about students um, really is critical to the success and future of higher education as we move forward. Marlene, that, that is just such an interesting point about the students, their preferences. One of the things that's been accentuated for, for us here is we're, because of COVID, I, we're in much closer connection with these 
students' parents than ever before. When we, we've been doing weekly, I do a weekly live update every week. We're doing twice a week for a while. Several hundred people on that call, a lot of them parents. The parents are so much more upset about remote learning than the students are, uh, is what we found. And, and so enlarging that conversation so that we're talking to parents and students at the same time about what we're doing, because the parents come to their perception of college is more what we did. Uh, as you were just pointing out, not what your son is is doing. And, and being able to talk about that, I, I don't think that, I, I don't feel we've got that message down uh, yet at Tennessee, I would say that. We need to keep working on that. Great, thank you. Well, several of you have touched on this issue, uh, but I'd like to direct a question at Russell um, uh, about the whether or not your student-centric approach has evolved in ways that you think will transcend COVID uh, and, and will go beyond this moment. In other words, do you see this moment as a shift in the paradigm for higher education going forward? Um, certainly, um, and, and it's, it's such an important question. I feel like the conversation we've had for this entire panel has been important and I especially appreciate uh, the the last uh, five minute conversation that we had because our students are different than we were when we were students in university. And at Amarillo College, we've committed to loving the student we have, not the student we used to have or the student we wished we had, but actually falling in love with the student we have because they're smart and capable, but they are different and need us differently. And the pandemic has exposed that need. I don't think it has created it. I think it's just exposed it and called us to a, a greater sense of intentionality and purpose that we don't need to lose. So for us, the case management system uh, will stay in place. The, we required mental health uh, first aid training for every employee and faculty at the college. That will become a part of our yearly experience. We, um, we've expanded the use of emergency aid. We've expanded uh, and, and now actually in the, the top 26 classes that we enroll have embedded required tutoring that has only exacerbated student success uh, that will stay in place. Uh, and the whole panels talked a lot about community. And when we were in first lockdown, uh, we actually reduced our drop in withdrawal rates by 34%. And it was because every student had, every, every employee at the college, faculty and staff had a list of five to 10 students that they called every week. How are you? Where are you? What resources do you need? And started gluing our students to the resources they needed uh, to survive the pandemic. That can't just be a pandemic activity. We've learned that once we can glue ourselves to our students in a more intentional way, a more relational way, uh, that even in a pandemic, they can be successful. There's no reason why that intentionality in relationship building and community building uh, can't survive COVID. It needs to, to live beyond. And, and so many things that we've talked about, um, I think will will be things that stay forever. We'll have more online options than we've ever had. We'll have more online degrees than we've ever had because students want them and like the flexibility of them. Um, and what we've learned, we've, we've had more students be served in an online mental health counseling experience than have ever been served in a face-to-face -face experience. They like the safety of it, the convenience of it, we will keep that. Um, that'll be the predominant way that our students engage with mental health counseling. Those, the, the paradigm that I think we've embraced and Donde talked about the, the intentionality of our mission and the clarity of what we were all trying to focus on. We don't need to lose that, but, but what that clarity was, was listening to our students, finding out what she needs from us and then using our resources to serve her we can do that more intentionally post-pandemic. Thank you, Russell. Uh, Maury, you wanted to comment? 
Yeah, I just want to echo some of what Russell just said, which is I think many of us, and it also builds on what Marlene was just talking about, I think many of us in the pandemic are learning the vital things that our students absolutely want to be able to have in person on our campus communities and the things that actually can and perhaps be better transmitted remotely allowing for the kinds of flexibility that many of our students need. We have always had a large number of commuter students who are an important part of our community. And there are classes that actually probably translate better to an online format would make the demands of commuting and working, which many of them are also doing, more flexible and easier to approach, and in fact, could expand our capacity. I mean, one challenge that many state institutions face are bottleneck courses where we maybe don't have enough faculty, but delivered remotely, we can serve more students and maybe serve them better. So, you know, mental health services, connection services, we have commuter students now engaged in organizations and clubs who never before would have been able to because they had to leave campus to return to their homes to work jobs in order to make money to attend school, but they can do so remotely in the evening. So I think we all need to sit back and ask ourselves after listening to our students, what is it that we continue doing in the ways we've started doing during COVID? And then what are the things from the past that we actually will be really anxious to get back to? And I think all of us will probably end up with uh, a mixture of those things. And it gives us, it's been giving us great opportunity to innovate and experiment. Well, thank you so much, Maury. In fact, I was going to ask about commuter students. We had a question coming in in the Q&A about that. So does anyone else want to make a comment about commuter students? Well, I think I think you touched on the key issues and, I, and with, some, with some great strategies. So thank you for that. And Maury, since I have you uh, speaking and since you're off mute, let me ask you the next question, which has to do with what tools you've developed to reduce the gap for both persistence and graduation rates for underrepresented minority students or for economically disadvantaged students or for first generation students. That is a big issue at all colleges and universities. So what have, what have you been doing? Absolutely, and thank you so much for that question. In fact, we were noted by Times Higher Ed as being the number one institution in the US for reducing social inequalities. And that's a mixture of the work that we've done with graduation rates for our uh, underrepresented students, our first gen and Pell students, where actually they are graduating at higher rates um, than our non-Pell um, and non-URM students, about a 4% gap, 79% versus 75%. So that is work that our campus community has been really committed to over the last decade, and we've seen really significant improvements there. And a lot of it's been around things that um, I know many other campuses are working on as well, and that is, you know, how do we create that sense of connectedness? How do we early on connect our students to knowing about the resources that are there to support them, whether that be in academic tutoring support, um, peer support, mental health support, um, as well as getting them connected and involved on campus. And those have been enormously important pieces of that that have made such a difference. We had a big campaign focused on Finish in Four, some of which was just around changing a mentality um, to get everybody really bought into um, the importance and the ways in which it sets them up for success in future. Um, if you finish in four years rather than stretching it out over um, a long period of time. Um, so we've been doing a lot of that work. I would say during COVID, some of the um, new issues that have emerged, and a couple of people have already touched on this today. And one is the, the ways in which going to remote revealed um, a lot of the inequalities that existed in our 
student body, whether they did not have the hardware that was necessary to be able to access, access coursework or whether it was access to broadband. I mean, that is such an enormous problem for the US. I serve on a commission in New York State where one of the things we are going to be arguing for is that broadband should be treated more like a utility. Everybody should have access to broadband. I don't know whether we'll have any luck, but it's certainly an important piece that the pandemic has really revealed as a fissure that is only going to exacerbate inequalities. It was one of the reasons why when we went to remote learning in March, we left our campus open to any students who wanted to remain here because many needed the access to a safe place to study, a safe place to have access to Wi-Fi, found it a community a space where they could learn more successfully than if they returned to their home communities where they maybe didn't have access to those things. Um, many of our Pell and first generation and economically disadvantaged students lost jobs that were so important to supporting them uh, in their educational outreach. And so in addition to making sure that we got as much CARES Act money as we could to those students, we also immediately turned to our donor base to raise a lot of money in support of our students in need and establish a student emergency fund um, to so that our students could apply for additional monies to help support them during this pandemic. Um, and there is more need out there than we've been able to meet, certainly, but we've gone a long way towards being able to address those needs. And so I would say some of those financial issues have been some of the most acute of the new stressors from the pandemic. Great, thank you, Maureen. Um, Wayne, would you like to comment on this? Yeah, sure. You know, um, obviously our student population lends itself us having strategies for this greater than 95% of my students are African-American or from an underrepresented minority uh, group. And we've done, you know, a few things that I'll mention that have really helped um, during the pandemic. And I think as a result, um, we'll see even greater results post pandemic. Uh, the first being that we started a GOT15 program where we ensure that every student um, who entered was taking at least 15 credits uh, a, a semester. We expanded the number of credits you could take from a max of 18 a semester to 21, recognizing that some students get caught at the very end trying to catch up and giving them some flexibility. We allowed students to take up to six credits every summer without paying uh, for tuition, they just paid fees. Uh, we also gave we give uh, currently a 50% rebate to students who graduate on time or early of any direct payments they made in their last semester. Uh, the first year we ran that program, we probably paid out 30,000. This past year it was over a million. So we're probably gonna have to suspend that soon um, as folks are catching on. But that really gave a big financial incentive. If you had tuition bill of 12,000 and you were contemplating taking out a, a loan for 12,000 12, versus um, you know, making some sacrifices. What we encourage families to do is to pay 6,000, take out a loan for six, and at the end of the semester, you get three back um, that you could put towards paying off that loan. So really you end up at the end of the semester with a $3,000 loan and a $12,000 bill that otherwise would have been a $12,000 loan. And, and those things have really um, helped. Our graduation rate over the five years that we've employed these strategies has gone up 20%. Uh, four-year graduation rate. We also don't talk about a six-year graduation rate at Howard. We talk about a four-year graduation rate uh, fairly consistently. And then we've also had a BSMD program for a long while. We just added this fall a BAJD program. Um, I do think that a lot of our undergrad programs could be done in three years um, as, as opposed to four. And so we really are trying to give students an opportunity who know where they want to want to be in terms of professional and graduate school, the opportunity to get there uh, much more quickly. And so, especially for students who don't have the means, uh, our strategy has been to do everything possible to cut their course. And the best way we think to cut their course is for them to spend as little time as possible with us um, while we increase the quality of that time. Great, thank you. Would anyone else like to comment on this? Well, unfortunately, we are running out of time. 
And um, uh, this has been such a great conversation. And I really want to thank all of you uh, for your participation. And I want to thank the guests out there for submitting questions. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, we may be able to follow up with some, some of these questions at a later time, uh, but there have been a number of good questions out there. But I'd like to take the last couple of minutes to turn, turn this back to uh, Marlene, who may have some closing comments she'd like to make. So take it up. So Marlene, to you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, uh, uh, George, for your willingness to uh, uh, moderate this panel today and to our panelists. This has been an amazing conversation. Hearing from you uh, about both your philosophies and your material strategies, I think it has been a really profound way to um, uh, come to the end of this term for those who are on semesters and really um, ask about how we can make an impact in the future going forward. And so I'm very grateful to all of you and I hope that folks will join us as we move into the next sessions. We have three concurrent sessions that follow this one on um, public health, uh, graduate students and student affairs, and then a final session that's a plenary session at the end of the day on mental health strategies. And, and the folks who are leading that session are gonna focus on uh, trauma-informed care and the ways in which that becomes so critical at this particular moment. So thank you very much for being here today. And thank you from the bottom of my heart to our amazing panelists and all their insights today.